This is learning in the flow. And uh, I'm really excited about this because we have our colleague, Gina Restrizado from Amgen. And uh, I'll say a couple more things about her when she takes over. But uh, uh, this is a kind of exciting session from my perspective because, you know, learning in the flow is one of those buzz phrases that's a big deal right now. And people talk about it, but the question is, how are people doing it? And so I think we're going to get some very interesting kind of wisdom, really, from Gina today. Um, I want to tell you a couple more things before we get into it. One is, um, it looks to me like most of the people here in the session probably know about performance thinking, but for those of you who are watching the recording, or if you uh, don't, uh, we have a YouTube channel, and you can get to it uh, with performancethinking.tv, and it's got all of our recorded webinars and a bunch of short playlists, so just for background if you want to know more. Uh, next uh, Next month, we're going to do a webinar on the power of accomplishment-based talent development. Now, people tend to do talent development with competency modeling, with skills and knowledge and so forth. But what we've discovered over the last few years is that if you focus on accomplishments or what we call work outputs, you can drive talent development in very interesting ways. So we're going to tell you what we've learned so far about that. Um, some other webinars coming up. We anticipate one on change management. Uh, one on culture, uh, cultural values, which is something that a lot of people have expressed an interest in, and we have a peculiar, unique approach to that. Uh, career path design, uh, I think our colleagues at RADCOM or, or um, Therese Longo will be talking about some very interesting work that they've been doing around that. And we'll talk about onboarding succession planning. There'll be a number of webinars coming up, and you'll, you'll get the information about them. Um, of course, for those who don't know, the way to register is if you go to our website at performancethinking.com, there's a little thing that says performance thinking free webinars, and you can click on there and register. And be sure to also click on the thing that uh, says register for future ones. Um, so we always like to try to figure out who's here. And so we do this poll. So if you could just uh, click which of these descriptors fits you best. Uh, training and development professional? Are you an o organizational performance consultant? Are you an HR, OD? Are you leader manager? We realize that you might be all, many of these things, but it's always helpful to get a sense of it. Looks like uh, right now, there's some training and development professionals and a whole bunch of others. So we clearly didn't include the uh, categories that cover some of you others. Um, uh, but let's see how this uh, plays out. Okay, we got organizational performance consultant folks too. So, uh, so it's it's always it always feels like a race uh, when people are filling this out. But I think it's just about stabilized now. Um, so the I think we should be able to share the results with you. But we'll see if that works. Uh, it may not work, but let me tell you what the results are. Uh, there's about thirty percent. Uh, training and development folks. There's about 20% mm -hmm. performance consultants. Uh, there's uh, about 20% leaders and managers, and there's about a third of you almost who are other. So that helps us know who we're speaking with um, and appreciate your filling it out. Uh, let's get back to our slides. So a couple more things before we get into it. Our Summer Institute, uh, which we're extremely excited about. It's going to be uh, the 11th uh, one, we had to skip a couple years because of COVID. So there's pent up demand. Uh, but you can save $500 if you register before May 1st. And if you happen to be a certified practitioner, there's even some more goodies for you that I think you probably know about. Uh, but it'll be in early June. And you can find out more about it again at our website, performancethinking.com. So uh, come on down. It's a wonderful and unique experience. So here's the agenda for today. I'm going to kind of kick this off and I'm going to talk a, just a tiny bit, at least from my perspective, about some technical and historical precedents for learning in the flow, uh, which, which really I think Gina will get into in far more detail. But this is why this topic was very interesting uh, to me. Uh, we've been talking about it for a while. And then I want to, for the benefit of anybody who's not familiar with our work, but even if you are, do a very high level overview of the elements, the models and logic of performance thinking, which really Gina will then show how it applies to uh, her work in learning in the flow. And then she'll spend some time talking about the work that they're doing at Amgen. And then hopefully we'll have some time at the end 
for some discussion and Q and A type of stuff. So, um, first of all, precedence. You know, I when when I hear the latest buzz phrases, I always think, well, wait a minute, is this really that new? Because we had people like. Joe Harless and others back in the 80s talking about job aids and how if you gave people a job aid while they were working, you might be able to get them up to speed on performance without training. So in some respects, that was learning in the flow 40 years ago or whatever it was. And then, of course, there was a crank, you know, in the 80s and early 90s, there were electronic performance support systems, which were, you know, EPSS, which were kind of job aids on technology and that was pretty cool too and of course we're now surrounded by those on the on the internet there's all kinds of interfaces that have prompts and help systems and such and then at some point just in time learning became a, a buzz phrase and people talked about having access to learning when you needed it and again often that was kind of job aids on steroids but there were different ways of doing that um, at some point probably four or five years ago i became uh, aware of this phrase that we used among some of our HR colleagues, agile talent development. And the idea was if you put talent development in the hands of the coaches or essentially managers, that they could coach and mentor their people and bring in resources to learn as needed. And in some respects, again, this was learning as part of the job rather than something you step out of your job and go do some training. Then, of course, 70, 20, 10, everybody, a lot of people know about that, which is most of the learning occurs outside of formal training was kind of what was prompted by that. And a lot of people start, talked about that in different ways. In fact, Gina was one of our colleagues who did so, recognizing that we can think about performance improvement uh, and a lot of the things we do to improve performance as perhaps being in that 70% uh, part of the pie chart. And then micro learning. You know, I first encountered this a few years ago. I'm sure others have also. A lot of times it means short videos that you can watch while you're on the job how to do something. And then we've got AI and we've got, uh, you know, uh, AR and virtual reality and all these things, all these new technologies. I tend to think of them as gizmos. And so one of the questions about this is like, okay, that's great. We got all these technologies. What do we do with it? And so that's what I think um, Gina will be talking with us about. But to me, there's a long history of this, and we're now kind of framing it uh, in, in, in under the phrase of learning in the flow. The, the question really is, okay, that's great, but how do we design it? How do we decide what to include? What, what, you know, what's the substance here? And what I want to talk about a little bit is performance thinking as a framework for thinking about that. And then, um, and then Gina is going to really go for it and show us how they do it. So, you know, it may be, not be a new idea to many of you, but performance thinking, relatively speaking, relative to the human performance improvement world was kind of a new idea because it was when we started to do this work almost 15 years ago now, uh, it was the same thing as performance improvement is, which is analyzing and communicating about performance in ways that are evidence-based and actionable, but using simple visual models and plain language. So those of you who know our work know that we, as we say, we have two pictures and 21 plain English words. And by having that, it enables us to work across different levels and functions because we're not using jargon really to build communities of shared practice across different groups that might otherwise be stuck in their silos of jargon and drives collaboration, and continuous improvement. So that's, that's sort of what, performance thinking is or has been. And the, the name came up from our clients years ago when they told us, you know, you're giving us some tools and such, but really you're just giving us a different way to think about performance with some tools added. So I tend to think of this as a thing that anybody in an organization can sort of look at performance through this framework, these models, and make a difference. Uh, we always say that performance thinking answers three questions, and I want to give you a real quick overview of how we think about that. First one is, what is human performance? What are the units of analysis? How do we look at performance, pull it apart, and understand what we have? And then once we do that, what influences it? And everybody knows that that's a long list, depending on what training you've gone to or you know, Harvard Business Review articles or training sessions or whatever it is. There's a lot of stuff that people think of as influencing performance. And the question is, you know, how do we, what do we make of that? And if we've got answers to the first two questions, the third one then is what do we do about how do we use this to manage and improve performance? So the first one, how, you know, what is 
human performance. Tom Gilbert, as many or perhaps most of the people who are in the in the session now know, Tom really introduced a big paradigm shift when he said in his book, which is still taught in graduate schools, uh, human competence. Um, you know, he said in the great cult of behavior, behavior is viewed as an end rather than as a means to an end. But we must enable people to produce accomplishments, the valuable products of behavior. Now, some people picked up on this and some didn't. But when they did, it was an enormous paradigm shift that leaders like Joe Harless and Gary Rumler and others engaged in. And performance thinking is accomplishment based in that regard. We focus on the out what we call work outputs uh, uh, of behavior to start our analysis um, rather than just on the behavior. So we have this model called the performance chain, and it's pretty straightforward. It just says that the elements of performance, uh, starting with the end in mind, are business results. And then once we understand what's at stake, we look at the work outputs, we figure out what people are producing of value. And then we're in a position to look at the behavior for producing it. And then there's all this stuff that influences uh, performance. Um, we know that it kind of works from left to right. You know, behavior influences have an effect, either get in the way or support behavior that ideally produce work outputs that are valuable because they contribute to business results. But we do analyze and plan it with the end in mind. Uh, and work outputs are really the anchor, the critical piece, the thing that most people or many people don't look at. And so that's extremely important. We know, and those of you who know this work recognize there's a lot of work outputs. And one of the reasons that we created this list over the years is because a lot of people, when they think about accomplishments, have a very narrow view of what they might be. They think they're deliverables or maybe something else. These are words that are not, strictly speaking, it's not a taxonomy, but these are words that help us to think about work outputs or accomplishments that we might not have already thought about. For example, decisions. Not everybody thinks of those as outputs. A lot of people think of those as behavior. But if you think about it, at the end of behavior, you have a thing, which is a decision. Or relationships. Or milestones and progress indicators, which are simply outputs in a process or a sequence. Uh, people who, you know, people who can do and produce something better ought to be the ultimate output of a trainer, for example. So there's a lot of types of work outputs. And when we're doing analysis, we want to be sure to look for them. Uh, we can look for them at the organizational level. This is a what's known as an organizational relationship map. Most of the work that I do does not involve that because I'm not usually working with whole companies. But this happens to be an organizational relationship map that you can't even read because it's so detailed and small type. But it's, it's a picture of a whole company. It happens to be a behavioral health company. And all those boxes are the departments and groups and teams both within the company and then outside, the providers, the the competition, the, the customers, and so forth. And so you can start at that level and work down or backwards into the processes and groups that produce outputs. So that's one place to look for them. This is far more common. This is a very simple process map that's producing a content specification document. It has three performers, the author, the editor, and the approver. Most people do process maps with boxes that have activities or behavior in them. We, we make a big deal of identifying the milestones or outputs of each of those steps because that allows us to measure and diagnose where things are going wrong or where there's opportunities for improvement. And then finally, we have what we call the individual performance map, which is the performer, either a role or even an individual in the middle, and all of the customers, all of the people to whom he or she delivers value and that value comes in the form of countable nouns, that is work outputs. So these are the ways we look for work outputs. Um, and that's how we define performance. So if we got a definition of that, now what influences performance? And so to move really quickly into this, we kind of started out with Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model, which was a brilliant contribution because it recognized that you can take all the factors that influence human behavior and you can sort them into these six categories and that it's a system where all these components are interactive. I got involved in this early in the 80s when we were doing training for sales and customer service organizations. And we were down in the knowledge cell of this model. But what we recognized was that if you didn't also support the application of that knowledge by setting, by giving people information about what they're supposed to do, by providing the right tools, by arranging incentives, that you were not going to get a very good return on investment. 
So we, I and my sort of performance improvement nerdy colleagues love this thing. But the problem was the language was problematic. So when we started to share it with our clients and our stakeholders, they'd ask questions like data. Like, what does that mean? Is that spreadsheets or is that a database or what is that? Or instruments, that sounds like an ohm meter or a personality test, et cetera. And so we would get a lot of errors and misunderstandings. So I, I, with my colleagues and clients, spent about several years in the late 80s tweaking the language until we came up with plain English language that we could give people. They would fairly quickly understand what we were talking about and not make a lot of errors. And so that's turned into what's become the six boxes model, which I've been talking about since the late 80s. And although we didn't actually name it until something like 1991, when my late colleague, Tom Hogan, I was struggling with it because I said, well, this is Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model with different language. I sort of don't know what to call it. Da, da, da. And he just said, you always talk about those boxes. Why don't you call it the six boxes? So it was another case where a client named our thing. But this is the framework we use to both analyze and then design performance systems. And, uh, you know, Gina's going to be talking about how this works. You can think about it. This is these are kind of small type here. But I started with just do some doodling before we before the webinar. And I was thinking, if you thought about all those learning and the flow kinds of things, job aids and so forth, you can already look at them through the frame of the six boxes and notice that, for example, when you set training objectives that are based on work outputs or accomplishments, you're already setting expectations for performance if they're outputs that are valuable on the job. When you have leaders or managers or peers modeling desired performance, you're setting expectations in a way that will lead eventually to learning if it's followed up with other things and so forth. So you can look through these and begin to recognize that learning already is not just in the skills and knowledge box. And again, we'll be hearing a lot more about that. Um, so that's what influences human performance. The six boxes framework is the way we think about that. So now what do we do with it? Well, what we do with it is pretty straightforward. We sort of paste these two models together and we say, let's, and we call it the performance improvement logic. We say, okay, let's be sure we understand what's at stake for the organization. So we look at organizational or business results. And then we say, okay, now let's look at whatever the hunk of performances we're being asked to improve or develop. And so we identify the work outputs. And we want to be real sure, by the way, that those work outputs contribute to business results. And then we say, okay, now we know what the work outputs are. Let's investigate the behavior. Let's do task analyses. Let's observe successful performers. Let's maybe do exemplary performer analysis. But now we're focused on the behavior needed to produce those work outputs. Once we have those things, we can think about measures. We can measure business results. They're lagging indicators, but it's important to measure them. We can measure behavior. It's kind of expensive to do because you usually have to watch people, but it's good for feedback and it's good for diagnosing why things aren't happening. And you can measure work outputs by counting uh, you know, the, the good ones. Uh, um, <laughs> That's a great chat comment. Anyway, once you do that, then you look at the behavior influences. And we use the six boxes framework. And what we do is we basically analyze in each of the cells of that model what's working and what's not, if it's an existing performance. And then we brainstorm. We say, how could we possibly improve uh, you know, in each of the cells what, what's going on? And that's kind of a little dab of design thinking or design engineering. And then ideally with stakeholders, we choose those behavior influences and configure a combination of things which we think is cost effective and will work. But of course, we never know for sure. So ideally we implement and we measure and we tweak, which is kind of the agile, you know, iterative approach. Um, and then we tend to share that language. So the thing about the shared language is because those 21 plain English words are pretty simple, we can basically work with almost anybody at almost any level to engage them in either projects or coaching or what have you. So that's the really quick and dirty overview of performance thinking. And Gina is going to tell us how this has applied in her work uh, to learning in the flow. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, unclick and she can turn to her slides. But I always like to say about Gina, she's been the head of a, 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 you know, leading a community practice at Amgen, a very large global company for what, a decade or plus or minus. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been 
close to 300 certified practitioners, performance thinking practitioners there, not all of whom still work there, but that's a big number. And I always like to say about Gina that she's actually, including me, the most experienced and most in-depth performance thinking professional on the planet because of the size of her community. So let me stop my slides, turn it over to uh, Gina, and let's hear what she has to say. Thank you, Carl. All right, so great to be here. Um, I was really excited to have Carl ask me to participate today. And I'm gonna give you just a, a little snapshot of one way that we use performance thinking um, at, at Amgen. Let me share my slides. All right, so um, let's talk about learning in the flow. And I think it's good to begin with what does it mean? We've all heard about it. It's, as Carl said, it's a, it's a kind of buzz phrase and it has been for quite a while. Um, Josh Burson was the first one that coined that phrase. And this is really what it means. You see several examples here. And, and again, as performers, all of us can relate to that. Staff report, you know, lack of time. So they want to learn while they're working. Um, learning needs to be ongoing and embedded and available. And we know that from, you know, things that we do at home when we forget how to change a bag on our vacuum cleaner, then we can go to YouTube and we can find out where our vacuum cleaner model is and how to change that bag immediately. So it's available to us. Employees see the value of a tool or process during task performance, and, and that makes sense as well, because sometimes training can be days, weeks, or months before you're actually performing that task. Learning in the flow also provides answers to on-the-job questions and therefore real-time support. And I think most importantly is this last one, that learning becomes embedded in work itself. So I, I, when, I, when I think about that, all of us go through training to, to do our jobs. And, um, and when we have that learning embedded in the work, then that's really how we're building proficiency. So rather than removing people from their jobs for a training event over and over again, the question is, how can we do a better job embedding this in the work that we're doing? And here are a lot of different choices that we have as, as learning professionals when we think about learning in the flow, and Carl mentioned several of these. Probably the most standard ones that come to mind are the instructor-led training or e-learning courses that we develop. But then there's a lot of other choices. There's micro-learning, you know, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes on a particular topic. There's different videos or podcasts. A lot has been done with gamification where there's leaderboards and people compete with each other and there's motivation to learn through scoring and who's the leader this week in a particular game. A lot of virtual and augmented reality apps are in development. I'm sure many of you are seeing that at your work. I know I am at mine, the HoloLens, that kind of distant learning, especially now with COVID over the last couple of years, that um, those, those distant learning and virtual learning applications have been really important. Then there's job aids. Carl talked a lot about that. Those have been around for a while, but there's all kinds of different and new ones that we experiment with. And then that just-in-time support that comes from coaches and mentors, subject matter experts that are, that are there. I like to think of this category as the phone a friend. If you're right in the middle of something and you need help, who can you go to to answer your question? And, and we all know we've got those list of people that we reach out to. So there's lots of different options as a learning professional, and you have to decide which one do you choose. Is it just the flavor of the day, something that seems interesting to you at any given time? Do I say I'm going to pick augmented reality because I've never done that before or a podcast sounds fun? How do we pick those? It has to be, from my perspective, very systematic because although it's great to experiment with all of these, we really want to target our, our choices. How do we do that? How do we design a holistic performance strategy. And when I use the phrase performance strategy, it's twofold. It's not only the training solutions, but it's also the non-training solutions, those performance solutions that are embedded in the overall strategy. And the way we do that is we start with the performers. 
Now, in a company like mine, and I'm sure this is true for, for most of you, there's a lot of different types of performers. There can be new hires where this is their very first job. It can be a new hire that has years of experience within the company, but outside of a particular area or job function. There can be people that come in who are new hires that have had years of experience in the same industry, but in another company. And so there's different things that your company does differently than their other company did. And then there are those incumbents who are average performers, people that do a good job at what they do versus those incumbents who are exemplary. They're the superstars, not in every single thing, but they are exemplary in a handful of things. And we have to see what are they exemplary in? What type of tasks are they notable? What do people think about when they think about that, that task and who the people are that always know how to do it and do a great job? And then there's management who's overseeing all of them and they're performers themselves too because they're interfacing with all of the other performers that I just mentioned. So how do we design a holistic strategy that works for all of these different types of performers? Well, this is how we begin. We start with our stakeholders. Our management team, typically different clients that come to us who are leading an initiative, for example, or a project. And we say, what's your future state? Let's imagine that you could design a future state, a blue sky vision, and everything that you designed would come true. What would that look like? How do we get there? What do each of these performers as that we're looking at here on the screen Ex the exemplary performer, the average incumbent, the various types of new hires, your management team. How do all of us help you get to that future state? And that conversation sometimes is a, um, is a different one for clients. They're not necessarily thinking about that high level strategic view of the future. And I think as performance consultants, our job is to help them get to that point. And the way we do that is first of all, talk about the business results that come from that conversation of the blue sky vision. And here are some examples of the type of business results I would see at my company. There could be, you know, safety, certainly quality and compliance, employee engagement, client engagement, client retention, you know, revenue, profit, you know, continuous improvement. Those different types of things would be the type of business results. And we would identify one or more of these as part of the client's blue sky vision and then determine what type of performance strategy we can design with all of the different performers in mind to help them reach those business results. The way we do that is exactly what Carl was talking about a minute ago with the performance chain is first we think about the work outputs that each of the performers must produce to achieve those business results. And what does good look like? So first we think about what's the criteria for good as defined by the stakeholder, by management and by different levels of management. It's not necessarily just the top of the house, the executive management. We have to have that management chain engaged in this. And then also, what are the downstream recipient customers looking for? What's that requirement? And if we don't ask that question, there's often a churn right at that space where somebody will think they produced a good one. But because the criteria hasn't been clearly defined and communicated, the recipient of that work output might say, no, this isn't quite right. Can you do this piece of it again? And you can go back forth, back forth, and a lot of time and resources are lost at that space. So that's why we really need to come to an agreement with what good looks like with the downstream customer as well, so that we're sure that we're clear and don't have that kind of variance. Then we look at the behaviors required to produce a good work output. And here is where I'd like for you to consider the scenario. Think back about the different performers that I described a few minutes ago and the behaviors required for each of those performers to produce the same work output. So we've already identified the criteria for good, but now we're thinking clearly there's gonna be a difference 
between the new hire and the average incumbent and the exemplary incumbent for producing that same work output. And this is where you begin to think about what they're going to need for that behavioral support. What are those pain points? What do you expect to be the pain point for a new hire? And oftentimes we find that out very clearly from the average incumbent who was a new hire and they're telling you about all the pain points, all those things that they had to learn along the way. With the exemplary performer, the exemplary incumbent, not only do they remember pain points, but they also know the tricks of the trade. They're often telling you, this is what I do. And so now their subject matter expertise is helping guide that course for us. So that's why we then think about the behavioral support, the influence that, are requ that is required by performers with different levels of experience. Now, this is where we go back to learning in the flow. The different levels of experience that are going to be part of our task force that are producing the same work output. How are we making sure that they all produce it and how do we build proficiency over time? So a performance strategy is now designed with both training and non-training solutions. And it's designed with each of these types of performers in mind. So there's a variety of, of uh, solutions that are made available to this group. This is where we think about learning in the flow. So imagine the exemplary performer. They might not need a job aid. They might not need coaching. They might do this, this so well that it's almost secondary to them. The issue with exemplary performers is sometimes they're so good at it and so fast at it that they're not necessarily thinking while they do it. And we all know that. We all have those routine tasks that, let's say, that we do in the kitchen, that we know how to make cupcakes so perfectly that we don't really think about it. And then it's not until we take the cupcakes out of the oven that we, forgot, we realize that we forgot to put a main ingredient in there because we were working so quickly while we were doing it. So those are the things we think about for exemplary performers. For new performers, we know that they're going to need a variety of training and post-training support to help them even feel comfortable at producing it and, and, and then being able to build proficiency over time for them. With the new hires from different companies, they may have been really good at doing it at their other company, but they don't know how the new company does it, how your company does it. And so for them, we have to be showing them what that delta is. And so each one of these performers are, are part of that performance strategy. This is a slide that, um, that is probably my favorite slide that Carl has, has ever shared. I call this the soccer girl slide. And whenever I'm in the middle of a really challenging performance analysis, I come back to this slide and it calms me down and it simplifies exactly what I need to think about. And this is what it looks like. You see this um, soccer player or depending on where you are in the world, football player. And that behavior is very obvious. She's kicking the ball and she's hoping that she's going to get that ball into the net. That's going to be her work output. And she can count how many times she does that. Why? Of course, because she wants her team to, to win the game. There are a lot of different behavior influences, though, that are required for that moment in time. Think about just that moment in time, that young woman kicking the ball. In order to get to that moment in time, there's been a lot of training. There's been coaches. There's been parents and school buses driving the players to and from the soccer field. Look at that beautiful lawn. There's a groundskeeper who's keeping the grass cut and drawing in the white lines and all of this variety of things, volunteers that are paying for uniforms. That moment in time cannot happen without all of those things coming together. And as performance strategists, that's what we're thinking about. And there can be pain points and issues in any one of these that could prevent that moment in time from happening. But consider this scenario, going back to learning in the flow. What about if this is the performer's first time playing soccer? 
Okay, maybe she's completed basic training required for every member of her high school soccer team. What does she need to build proficiency as a new soccer player? Or consider this scenario. This performer played soccer all the way through elementary school. In fact, she was a star st soccer player in elementary school. But this is her first season of high school soccer. She's completed the basic training like everybody else. But what does she need to build proficiency and fluency over time? Obviously, that's going to be different from the person who is playing soccer for the first time. So again, you're thinking about learning in the flow. What are the different options that we need to provide for her? If we look at the industry I'm in, in biotech, it's the same thing. We have this behavior. We're performing, this uh, individual is performing a step per procedure. Ultimately, the work output is a bulk drug substance, and the business result that we provide for our patients here in this example of a, of a doctor's office is supply, safety, compliance, and market share, as an example. So same as the soccer girl, but now we're looking at it through the lens of biotech. And all of you could be picturing right now what that moment in time would look like for your industry. Again all kinds of different behavior influences required for that moment in time to happen. And we're also thinking again about the level of performance of that individual. So that is what's determining how we create a performance strategy for that person. So let's look at it about in, in this way. For this individual, we're thinking about, first of all, basic training. In, in our industries, you have to be um, complete, you have to have completed a certain amount of basic training before you can do any tasks. And let's say in this example, that was procedure reading, SOP, standard operating procedures. Perhaps there was instructor-led training. Perhaps there were a number of practice sessions with an instructor on how to put that tubing onto the bag. And then there's a training qualification, which in my industry means that somebody has performed the task flawlessly so that the instructor can say, yep, you're ready to go. All of this is now recorded in our LMS. That's our document management system where we can at any point in time pull that out and look that that person has finished the training. Okay, but how do we build fluency over time? What does that look like? Again, it depends on that performer and what they come to the job with. What's their capacity when they begin? What happens over time? Are they a quick learner? Are they hesitant? What are we going to provide beyond the required training? So we provide, say, routine feedback. We've got people on the floor that are giving them that feedback regularly. They have access to subject matter experts and just-in-time support. There's coaching and mentoring. And maybe what we also do is topic-based micro-learning. Maybe the task that he's performing, he only needs to do once every three months or once every six months. And that is something that we want to make sure that they, even though they've been trained initially, that there's something that they can remind themselves about what good looks like through that micro learning. So again, these are the things that we're designing in order to think about building that kind of proficiency. So in summary, what we're thinking about for all of us is let's look at our beginners first and your goal for the new performer at that beginning level. It's going to be basic skills and knowledge, that required behavior that's needed to produce a good work output. The next performer you're thinking about is the intermediate performer. And in this case, you are building skills and knowledge over time. What you're going for now is sustained and confident behavior. We don't want an intermediate performer to have that heart flutter and to feel nervous about performing a task. We want that confidence to be built in so that we can see consistency in the work outputs. And then finally, you have your advanced or your exemplary performer, what are we looking at for them? We want to build subject matter expertise from them. We want to make sure that we're, we're building exemplary behaviors where you see advanced capability and what I would call masterful outputs. And then what happens when you've got that team of people is that everybody else learns from them and we, and we raise that bar so that we are all working toward masterful, error-free work outputs. 
So performance consultants set that course for learning in the flow. It's not by happenstance. I'm not just picking something because I happen to like it or it feels like something I should try out. I'm targeting my performance consultancy to ask those questions to my clients, understanding who their staff members are and how to build a strategy that's going to work so that this flow is consistent. And then the really important piece is this aspect of it where we periodically assess how we've done because we're not gonna get it right the first time. We have to sustain this over time. So we identify either an opportunity or an issue we are brought in as performance analysts. We set a series of recommendations based on that blue sky vision that our clients are trying to achieve. We implement those recommendations. We revise them, measure them, talk to people about it. How's it going? Figure out what worked, what didn't work again. Thinking about the different levels of performers in that conversation. And then we assess it and revamp it when we need to, tweak it. And that's how we are, are always able to reset that course. And I think if anything that I've learned over the years, it's this piece that it can't just be, you know, check the box, I'm done with it. Even at even the most detailed performance strategy, one that was really thought out at the beginning, you always need to go back and say, is this working? What can we do to, to support continuous improvement of this? And so finally, um, here's the key takeaways uh, that, that I think is important for all of us to consider as performance consultants. Always advance the business results by working with your clients to chart their future state. We can achieve this. We can help them achieve their blue sky vision. Then create performance strategies that consist of both training and non-training solutions. When you think about learning in the flow strategies, remember that you're designing those for your performers and it's part of an overall performance strategy. It's not the whole thing. There's a lot of other environmental and individual controls and influences that are part of it. Then you're going to evaluate your performance strategies through periodic assessment. You're going to do it through metrics. That's going to be your client business metrics and see how we're doing, get their feedback, not only of management, but the performers that are all working toward this blue sky vision, see what they're thinking, and then revise and reset that as you need to, you know, periodically with your clients so that we make sure that we are achieving their business results. And that's it. Fantastic. So, um, so what we're going to do, we'll probably get rid of this slide in a minute, but before we, and so we can have a conversation, I, I know it's at least one question in the chat box, but I just wanted to put this up for a few moments, um, just as kind of our shameless commerce bit, which is, uh, there's some, a lot of free resources. We have a resource library at performancethinking.com with articles and white papers and such. The YouTube channel at performancethinking.tv is getting pretty rich. There's a lot more, a lot of stuff. And of course, our LinkedIn group, which often looks like just a series of ads. But if you ask a question, there's some pretty smart people there. You'll get some answers. And then if you want to become a, a, a practitioner and you're just a single person in particular, of one or two people, we have the open program coming up in May. But let me uh, just stop the slides uh, because we can now both be here. What I see is one question uh, from Scott. Two things. Uh, Scott Scott says, uh, do you use the LMS to record feedback just in time support, coaching, et cetera? And then also, how do you counter track learning in the flow? That's a really good question. And, um, and the answer is both. Sometimes we do track in LMS. Typically what that it looks like, our, our instructor-led training, our web-based training um, would be tracked there. Sometimes micro-learning is tracked in, in that as well. If clients really want to track whether somebody has looked at a job aid or something like that, we can. But typically we don't have that rigor around that because really those other things outside of the required training are not something that is required for all levels of performers. People can choose what they want to, to use. So if I need a job aid because it's been a while since I've done it and I'm feeling like I need some support, then I can 
take a look at that job aid. If I'm very confident, I've done this for a long time, I don't need it, then I don't use it. And so those would not be recorded in LMS, but really a good question. The reason, the way we record it is through um, our, our sometimes customer surveys or feedback that we have with our clients when we talk to, to frontline managers, people that are on the floor to see if this is, if it's working. So, um, so I don't know if there are any other questions or comments. We've got some, if not, I have some questions for, for Gina, but I'm wondering, uh, does anyone else have anything they want to ask about? Thanks for your, thanks for your comment, Roger. Yes, indeed. It was a great presentation. I must admit. Anything else? Well, I have a question for you, which is that you're in biotech, you're in a highly regulated environment. And so there's a bunch of required stuff. And I was thinking about your comments about exemplary performers who might kind of forget to put the salt in the cupcakes or whatever, because they're doing things so quickly, or uh, just the requirement that people really get it right. So I don't know about where all the people are who are now observing or, part, you know, who are attendees here, but there's regulated environments and there's not so regulated environments. And I'm wondering how you think about uh, you know, the kind of, uh, I don't know, formality and sequencing and all the rest of it of learning in the flow with that difference in mind. Yeah, and obviously for those of us that work in regulated environments, that's a very critical question. I mean, the regulations require that we ensure that staff are trained before they perform tasks. And the way we do that is we do a risk assessment on the task to see how difficult it is how, um, you know, how complex, how often people will do it. Um, we look at sometimes the history of it to see how challenging it's been, you know, previously. And then we create a training strategy for that. And all of that has, and that's really what Scott was asking too about that, about LMS. All of that's tracked in the LMS so that if we need to pull that report to show that Carl was trained on a particular task, we can pull Carl's LMS report and see that you were trained in that space. Um, but then there's also the question about training effectiveness. How do we know that the training worked? And that is also where the learning in the flow happens. And so that you're seeing what that looks like, what I would say on the floor at the place of work is, are we truly building proficiency over time? That isn't something that is, is documented, but we're accountable for that. We need to be able to talk about how we're doing that to be sure that our training is effective and that our staff are performing the way we expect them to perform. So that reminds me of a bit of a tangent, but I've never asked you this before, which is, which is given that you're anchoring your performance analysis and your training to work outputs, not just behavior, um, I'm always reminded of sort of Bob Mager's criterion reference instruction, which is not so popular now, but the idea was you could check people off as to whether they could do a thing or not just as you can check people off as to whether they can pr produce a thing or not, it seems to me. And so I'm wondering in your training in general, as well as in this, how do you, how do you monitor what you just said, which is at the end of it, okay, they went through training. Fantastic. It, you know, check that one off. But how do you, how do you at, at Amgen identify whether people successfully can produce the outputs or not? Well, the, 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 uh, a standard way that's done is a lagging indicator, which is deviation. So we can count how many mistakes people make. But by the time we get to a mistake, the mistake yeah. has happened. And so really what we look at are those leading indicators and they vary by client, but one example would be right first time performance. Another example would be, you know, time. Um, if, if you are doing a particular task and we know that it normally takes, you know, five days to do, and the team has, it's taken the team seven days to do it or four days to do it, then we can make that evaluation based on the time it took. Um, there, so there's a lot of leading indicators that, that we can look at to, to ensure that, um, that the training is, is working as, as it needs to. And these, are, well, these so again, are conversations though that you have with your client. Because in, in my world, I can say this is what we're doing to track in the LMS, but the client right. is going to be telling you what it is that they're, that they're trying to measure. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's a good point. So Cindy has a question. If training doesn't work, what other strategies do you use, like environmental modifications? 
Any comments about well, that? I'm going to I'm going to challenge the if training doesn't work. So the, the training has to work. So if the training doesn't work first time through, then first of all, we have to redesign and rethink of the training strategy because we can't assume that if training doesn't work, then we're going to say, oh, well, that didn't work. Better luck next time and let's move into some, some other plan. So we have to make sure that, that the training works. And just at that training strategy piece, Cindy, we would be looking at that to say, do we need to refine that? Then post that, and I think this is really what you're getting at at your question, is then what type of behavior influences do we need to have in the environment in order to ensure that that training is sustained? Because here's the thing, some of the tasks are really complicated and we all know that. There's some easy tasks, there's some complicated tasks. The piece about the complicated task is that let's say that a performer is trained and passed their training qualification. We watch that they can perform a task to 100% accuracy. And sometimes they need to do that more than one time so that we can see that yes, I know that we know that they can, can do whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing. So in that sense, the training worked. But then what happens after that? What happens if that person does not perform that task for a while? And now they are unsure, they're feeling nervous about it. They think, wow, it's been eight weeks since I did that. Now what are we doing to support that? And that's the time where you wanna make sure that you have a balanced number of performers with different levels of skill that are available at that time so that they can provide coaching and mentoring that you can ask that a question. We have different, um, what we call error management tools that we would have where sometimes there would be somebody reading a step and the other person's performing a step. So you have kind of a check and balance that goes along. So, so there's a lot of things that we can do in the environment post-training to make sure that we have those kinds of performance strategies in place. So to extend that or to sort of maybe reframe the question a little bit, uh, it isn't like you say, oh, training didn't work, so we're going to do something else. Your strategy is really a performance strategy. Yes. So you put these things in place at, across, the, across the six boxes, at least the first four of them, I think. Is that fair? So it's not like, oops, box, box door four didn't work. We got to do something else. The something else is already built into the system, is it not? It, it is. And, and actually, Carl, sometimes it's box five, too. Sometimes we realize right. if there's a, a new task that we need to rethink box five and what type of capacity, mm -hmm. what kind of background does somebody need um, to reduce time to contribution in, in the, the mm -hmm. job as well. And, and oftentimes box six, if these are really if these these are really challenging tasks, we need to make sure that people, that their attitude about performing it, that they know that they've got that support so they can perform it with confidence. And you've got to have a workforce that that is like, I'm I'm in it, you know, and that they can do it. So we are thinking truly about all six boxes. So, you know, something is a new idea for me, actually, when you a minute ago, the previous comment you made about um, the balanced team or the people at different levels of expertise and how they can basically support one another. Um, this starts, this is, uh, you're kind of a, like a manufacturing environment, right? And so this reminds me of sort of lean Toyota production system types of things where you have a team and the team does things like swarms if there are errors and they basically learn with and from one another. And so in a, in a kind of a manufacturing or factory like environment, which is kind of what you guys are like with a clean room or whatever, um, uh, that makes complete sense to me in a lot of environments where it's not like that, like white collar type of stuff in offices, the same strategy could be applied. And I haven't thought of it so much, except in, for example, in some organizations where people have mentoring programs, you can think of it as at least there's that person, like you used the metaphor of the person to call on the phone. But can you say a little bit more about that, about how you try to be sure that it's a balanced team of people? I mean, that's, I think that's really interesting. It it is it is really interesting and something that we've spent quite a bit of time now in uh, when you're on the floor in that in your first example of the manufacturing it's a little bit yeah. easier because you know that you've got 
let's say 10 people on a shift and you let's say you're working 24 7 so you've got three shifts and you're going to be balancing you're not going to put all the new people on the graveyard shift right that's not going to work so you're so managers are very aware of that and they're balancing those um those staff members um across across those shifts but the bigger issue is what you're talking about. What happens with people who are isolated and have a desk job? A lot of us have found ourselves in that situation in COVID, you know, where they were not going back into an office where there's a team of people. So then what do you do? And um, I think all of us know who we are we need to call when we have a question about X. There's always the people on your team who you, you reach for to say, oh, I'm gonna call so-and-so because they know the answers to this versus I'm gonna call someone else because they know the answers to that. I think as a manager, I wanna make sure that people realize that I do not expect them to know the answers to all the questions. I expect right. them to be utilizing other people's subject matter expertise. I'm hiring mm -hmm. so that there's a variety of subject matter expertise within the team. And it's not considered um, a shortcoming in, in your skill set if you have to pick up the phone to call. So I mm -hmm. think that, um, that in one of the performance strategies that I designed a couple years back, we had a lengthy topic um, on this. And what we did is we put together a list of subject matter experts who were going to be resourced to help support a team. And these were people, like you're saying, with the desk job. And we requested that there was that, that resourcing um, requirement was made evident to those people on the list so that they weren't surprised by phone calls and that they had a certain amount of time designated per week to be able to answer questions like this. So it's not as obvious as it would be it, with a single shift of people, but essentially you accomplish the same thing. So this is, you know, we often when we're looking at box two, tools and resources, we have people in there. We have the manager should be a resource to people. There may be subject matter experts. There may be coaches, et cetera. And it seems to me that what you're describing is kind of box two on steroids in that regard. And it's really cool because if you take a very proactive, uh, for, for example, there's a lot of these tools out there, Slack and so forth, that are creating ways for people to stay in touch with one another. Sometimes they're used in kind of administrative project management like ways. But I've also seen uh, knowledge management systems, which had people identified with areas of expertise, which things that you could reach out to. So you didn't have to figure out your own list. And so part of it seems to me what you're saying is managers have to take responsibility for creating that environment. And, you know, our coaching program is about managers developing their individuals and using the six boxes to come up with agreed upon action steps to develop them. And so that would fit very nicely into this, a very proactive use of all the human resources available to you. I like that a lot. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Managers are a, 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 a huge percentage of the win, as we know. And, um, and we need them to really buy into it. And that's why it has to be beyond just training solutions. Yeah, no kidding. And they have to be really involved. It can't be. I mean, I recall her hearing when we first started working with you all a decade ago, the uh, uh, purposeful presence on the floor, mm -hmm. you know, having your managers get out of their office and work with people. Well, yeah. This is again, this is like moving forward with that in a really nice way. So before we probably need to stop pretty soon, but I wanted to highlight Roger Addison asked, how do you track your non-training solutions? And then Cindy also had a question, but any response to that question? Well, if we're talking about tracking, Roger, it's it's not something that we would track in LMS per se. What the way we're going to be tracking that is as part of the performance strategy in the documentation and product that we would provide for our clients. And so, um, on my team, if we have created a performance strategy that, let's say, has job aids or different types of communication, or we're working on a SharePoint site or whatever it is, obviously they would have those deliverables and they. They could be using that. If there's other things that we need to um, look at, for, like the example that I just said, where we need to have a group of subject matter expertise um, available for people to call, then we would work with management to make sure that those names, for example, are posted somewhere where everybody would know who to access. And then we're going to go and check back. But I mean, it's not 
the, the idea of tracking it is not as clean in these types of um, deliverables right. as it is when it's something that's within the LMS. And so it takes that kind of engagement and, and staff have to be working together. The beauty of this is I think more about it. You know, we always say you got to get out of the trading box. And some of the companies that I've worked with are doing some sort of learning in the flow, but it's very narrowly defined to we're going to put an AI tool in place. It's very much training is now adding technology or whatever. And the whole notion of a performance strategy that incorporates all of the, all of the different variables that includes especially management and coaching, um, this is a really nice, robust, I mean, it makes all the difference, it seems to me, because otherwise you can't say, well, we tried learning in the flow, but it didn't work. Yeah, well, get your managers involved. That'll help. Um, the other thing I was thinking about is by defining objectives as work outputs, it's a lot easier for a manager to be able to say, yeah, that bottle was properly labeled or not, as mm -hmm. opposed to watching the behavior and seeing if they do it right. They may have to do that eventually, but it strikes me that for any of these interventions, even if you don't have a super formal way of tracking it, any manager who's really engaged is going to notice the work outputs are either meeting criteria or they're not. And it seems to me you should be able to have a pretty quick feedback loop there. Is that is that real? Is that for sure. I mean, metrics yeah. are really how we're tracking it. And, and actually, Roger, that's probably a better answer to your question now that I'm thinking about it. If you're working with the business and you see that you have launched a performance strategy and you're measuring it, then you're going to be able to see whether your training and non-training solutions are working with the measures. Um, that that we're that we're choosing, and and hopefully we're choosing both leading and lagging indicators, so that we can can you know really get an understanding of what's happening in across the environment and with the performers. And doesn't that also plug back into your adding adding S for sustainment to Addies? My understanding is that you all st at Amgen still have a very conscious strategy of you implement something. And then it isn't just by happenstance. You agree with your stakeholders. We're going to check back at some point to see what's working and what's not. Is that is that true? That, that, then you got to yeah. go, go ahead. Yeah, that's definitely that's definitely the game plan. That's best case scenario, and it's something that is I. I I, I'll admit it's it can be a challenge because people are really busy, and by the time you're coming back to them six months later it, as part of sustainment, they they may be on to other projects and other initiatives. So it has to be really a cultural shift where people are realizing that there there isn't a an end game. You know, there's not a stopping point. If you really want to see something uh, succeed, there has to be a sustainment piece to it. And that's the thing about that is that's so much in contrast the classic training, which is kind of spray and pray, and then we're on to the next thing from the, and you, you all are taking a proactive approach, which is you're trying to engage your stakeholders in this follow-up and iteration, right? So that's, yep. I, I always think if it, even if you don't do a perfect job of the kinds of things you're talking about, you can be way ahead of the game compared to the baseline, it seems like. And that's true. Ooh. That's 100% true, and that's really good for all of us as learning professionals to know. I mean, before I got involved in this, I was an instructional designer, um, and I worked um, in, in for my own company independently, and I was just really targeted on those training solutions. And this has completely changed my career and how I think about the work that I do and what I'm accountable for with my clients. It's true. One other thing, and then we should probably – I just want to get Cindy's comment about – the, the, you know, can you do it if you put a gun to your head question that is won't do versus can't do. Is there any way you guys work with that, you know, sort of motivation versus ability or whatever you want to call it? You know, I have to say that I don't run into performers that won't do it. I mean, I, in fact, in all of my years of, of, of uh, consulting, when I am talking to a performer, whatever they tell me is their truth. I don't guess, I don't say, oh, come on. It's their truth. And I design strategies around that truth, even though there are different, maybe, you know, opinions from different people on the team, different opinions from management. And so I look at that as something that I need to resolve and management needs to resolve as a performance strategist. Um, and so, the, so it, when they can't do it, 
not won't do it, but when they can't do it, then I need to figure out how I can step up to the plate. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's the classic thing in like the pipe and maker thing where you get to this thing. Is it a, essentially, is it a consequences issue or is it a skills or knowledge issue? But you're looking at a bigger system than that, it seems to me. So yeah. anyway, I think probably we could go on for quite a long time because you have a lot of stuff to share with us. But I think we're probably done. We don't want to keep people too long. Thank you so much, Gina. This is uh, this has been quite a pleasure to uh, to just hear from you and to t talk with you about this. So thanks, everybody, Thank for coming. You. And yeah, and, and the recording of this, you can tell your friends in, in about 36 or so hours, it should the recording should be available. So uh, you can share it with your friends and colleagues. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining. Bye -bye.